if tonight before we're seated, could we open up our Bibles to Matthew 16, 5? Are we there? Okay. Matthew 16, 5, it says, Now when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said, take heed and beware of the leaving of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it is because we have taken no bread? But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000, how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves for, no, the seven loaves, the 4,000, how many large baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But to beware of the leaving of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he, that he did not tell them to beware of the leaving of the bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Verse 13, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? If you can have your seat. In this portion of scripture, Jesus and his disciples came into a town where the people were associated with idol worship. They were not believers of Christ Jesus. They were pagan worshipers. And it says that um, in verse 13, when he was asking, I'm sorry, in verse uh, 9, do you understand or remember the five loaves? Jesus was trying to remind his disciples, do you not know what I'm talking about? Do you not remember? I'm not talking about the, the bread. What I'm talking about is do not, do not get involved with the business of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so when in verse 13, Christ, of, Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? His disciples answered and said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But God wasn't concerned of what the people had to say. They were stuck in their ways, and he knew that. He was wanting to know what his disciples believed and said about him. He was checking up on them. And the title of my message is, It's Time for a Checkup. Look at your neighbor and say, It's Time for a Checkup. <laughs> Sometimes we need a checkup. Uh, verse 15 says, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. John 6, 68 says, also we come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. God is saying to us tonight, who do you say I am? Am I still the God in your life? Or has the cares of this world and your desires made you like the Pharisees and not recognize who I am. Who do you say that I am? My first point tonight is stand firm in faith and truth. One thing about the Pharisees were they were true to themselves. They were true to what they believed. They were true to what they were doing. They believed and their words, their words added up with their actions. And I believe that tonight God is telling us, who do you believe that I am? Do their actions line up with my word? Not with your word, but with my word. It says, but as, but, but as believers, we need to stand firm in faith and on God's word. 1 Corinthians says, 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, be watchful, stand firm in faith, be strong. We need to stand in faith and be strong no matter what the chaos or what's going on around us. 
We need to say who he still is and give God his place as we're going through our situation. God is saying, who do you say I am? He's not concerned to what the world says. Yes, he asks, but he's asking us believers, who do we say he is? Is he still the great I am in your life? Is he still the almighty God? Is he still the one that is in control of your situation? Is he still the one that that knows the beginning to the end? Is he still the one that knows the plans that he has for you and for me? Plans to prosper us and, and not to harm us, but plans of a hope and a future? Do we still call him that God? Do not merely listen to the word and and let us not merely just listen. It says our actions need to match up with God's word. James 1.22 says, do not merely listen to the word and deceive ourselves. Do what it says. And I know that sometimes even myself did I not do and be obedient to the Lord. I'm speaking to the choir. When he says to have faith, I didn't have faith in some situations. When he said to be obedient... I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And I wasn't saying, he was asking, who do you say I am? And by that I mean is, again, when things are falling apart in our lives, do we still say that he's faithful? When the doctor gives us a bad report, do we still say that he is the healer of all healers? (laughs) When, When our kids, the ones that are loved ones that we are praying for, that we are praying that they're going to come to the Lord, but we don't see it happening. Do we still say that he is a redeemer? He is our savior and that he died on that cross for our sins and that there is nothing that's impossible. He's a God of possibilities. Let me tell you, when the storms comes, do we waver and forget who he is or when things aren't going the way we want them to go, but are happening the way they need to happen? Do we take matters in our, an, in our own hands? I'll be the first to tell you that I've done that. Anybody here? I'm the only one. <laughs> Do we take matters in our own hands? Okay. And then, <laughs> do we still say that he is alpha and omega? I'm here to let you know that he is still the beginning and the end. He is a great I am. He is the almighty God, the author and the finisher of our lives. He is the everlasting God. He is a creator of heaven and earth. That every time when a situation happens, he does not change. The Bible says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Who do you say that I am? Are you going to go and on your own understanding, he's saying, or who do you say that I am? Because when we go our own way, when we think that he's not going to come through, we're saying that he is not faithful. He is not the faithful God. He is not the mighty God. And I'm going to tell you right now that he still is. Who do you say that I am? Point two, seek him to know him. James 4 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We need to stay in constant prayer and reading his words so we know who he is. If we don't have a relationship with the Lord and what it means about having a relationship with the Lord is a constant being in his presence. And that's in prayer and that's reading his word, but not only reading, but applying it. Who do you say that I am? Number three, discipline yourself. Stay consistent. Don't stop. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in well-doing, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest. Stay connected to the vine. Be accountable. Keep coming to services. Join a V group. And I like this quote by John Maxwell. It says, motivation gets you going, but discipline keeps you growing. That is the law of consistency. Surround yourself with sisters and brothers that are going to encourage and that are going to lead you in the right direction. Because God is saying that I want to do something in your life, but who do you say that I and tonight, And tonight I believe that he wants to encourage us and he wants us to, to grow our faith more because he doesn't change. 
I'm here to let you know, yesterday, I asked God yesterday, and I thank God for the opportunity when Pastor John called me and he asked. I had barely prayed, and I was telling God, Lord, use me. Use me, my God. And sure enough, he answers prayer really quick. <laughs> very, very fast. <laughs> but in the midst of all that, right, in the midst of all that, I was in my V group. And before my V group started, as I was excited, how many of us know that when things are happening, boom, here comes something to try to discourage us and test our faith. So what happened yesterday is that a few only here know that my mom was getting checked for cancer. And yesterday we got the news that she does. And the enemy will try to come in and tell me that he's not going to heal her. That I'm going to believe the bad report. But I'm not. That made me go, that made me go harder on the paint. I'm going to say this, and I'm going to continue to say that, the God, that God is still on the throne, that he is still the healer of all healers, that he is the beginning and the end, that he is Alpha and Omega, and I'm going to worship him till I go home, that I'm not going to keep my eyes on the situation. Sometimes we need to give God his space. We need to give him his place. And what I mean about that is that we need to separate him from our situation. He's not the situation. He's a problem solver. He's a problem solver. He's a healer. He's not the disease, right? And we know, we know that we know that God remains faithful. And I just want to encourage you tonight that get, who do you say, who do we say he is in our life? That is what God is asking tonight. Are you still going to serve me even when it doesn't go your way? Are you still going to worship and praise me even when the, when the doctor's report comes out how you didn't want it to come out? That's where the testing of our faith is going to be tested. But I'm here to encourage you, and I'm here to let you know that God knows what? Everything in the beginning to the end. I'm going to tell you right now, what God, how God knew me before I was formed in my mother's womb, he knew my mom. And he knows the plans that he has for her. Sometimes God is going to answer prayers. He's going to answer prayers not the way that we want them. But if I was already praying for my mom's salvation, this could be a way. So we have to keep it constant and stay disciplined in the Lord. I'm going to go ahead and close up. Father God, I just thank you, Father, for your word tonight, Father. And I just pray, Lord, that your word, my God, this word, Father, landed on fertile ground, God. I thank you, Father, for using me, Lord, and I pray that you may continue to have your way, my God, because you are, my God, Alpha and Omega. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to, I want to do something, uh, something a little special. This is like a teachable moment right now. You know, we are a growing church. Amen. We are a growing church. And God is saving people and raising people up, and, you, and everybody's looking good. Come on, somebody. So you know what happens when that's happening? Other people notice how good other people are looking. Come on, somebody, right? And so what's going to happen is that, you know, people are going to get together in the house of God. Come on now. And then we're praying. We're saying, God, bring some good, godly relationships together, Right? And, 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 and couples that are, they got their eyes on you, and they want to do what God's called. Because how many know we're ascending church? That means God is going to put people together so that he can raise them up and send them out. But before they go, they're going to build, and they're going to lead, and they're going to be examples. And because we're ascending church, there always has to be new leaders and new couples raising up. So it's a healthy thing for people to get together. And uh, we, in our church, we don't want to keep people apart, but we do want to make sure people get together right. So I want to give, I'm going to give you a couple tips. Is that okay? In Songs of Solomon, and I'm not giving you tips how to hook up, guys, so just, you know, hold on. If you want a tip, look up to hook up. Come on, somebody. Song of Solomon 2-7 it says, promise me, O women of Jerusalem, by the swift gazelles and the deer of the wild, not to awaken love until the time is right. The Message Bible says, don't excite love. Don't stir it up until the time is ripe and you're ready. 
right? That's a heavy verse. Don't excite love until it's time. Listen, God, it, God put it in us to want to uh, connect and get together and, 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 in, and not just like as a couple, but even physically. You know, God put those desires. But if you start doing things that excite that prematurely, you're going to get yourself in a wreck. And that's why we see, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, we have in, in the inner city, we see a lot of broken families. We see people with kids from multiple partners. And someone say, that's okay. No, that's not okay. It's not how God intended it to be. Now, we'll recover and make the best of bad situations. How many know God doesn't give up on us? And thank God for that. But just because, you know, we could recover and make the best of a situation, we should desire to want to have it God's way. You know what? I said something the other day, and I just stuck with me. I said, I don't want to settle for the permissive will of God. I've never wanted the, I want the perfect. Is there anybody else here that says, man, I want the perfect will of God for my life? Like, I want not, even if it's not the easiest, I want what he wants. I feel that God deserves to have people that want to do what he wants them to do. What does the Bible say in Romans? Those that are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So the desire for us should be spirit-led people, right? Not emotional-led. The goal for most of us after getting right with God is striving to honor him with our lives. And then we eventually want to find a person that we can answer the call of God on our lives with and build our life and share our love and, and do what God has called us to do. Can I hear someone say amen? Unless you're a eunuch or called to celibacy. Amen. But I hope no one gets that gift, right? <laughs> I believe that we all should know that as Christians, who we marry is the next biggest decision after getting saved. I'm going to say that one more time. Who you marry is the next biggest decision you make after getting saved. It's big. It's so important. So important. Some people don't treat it as important. So it's a problem. Oh, so what? I'm getting numbers. I'm talking to girls. I'm, even we've had issues in the men's and women's home, people trying to hook up and pass the notes. Listen, if you're in the home, the last thing you should be thinking about is who you're going to be dating. There is so many things for you to worry about. That's last on the list. How many can see the wisdom in that? That's why we catch people, Pastor, we're going to just ask them eventually. Just look, if you're not going to get it together, come back when you're ready. Because the home is there for people that say, hey, I'm here to get my life right and find a chick. Come on. No, no, no. You're, I said, I'm here to get my life right. Because if you can't even lead your own self, how are you going to lead someone else? You can't, you can't even stay faithful to God. How, how are you going to stay faithful to someone else? If God's only getting half your heart, what are you going to have for you and half for you? No. God gets our whole heart. Can I hear someone say amen? So what happens is that serious Christians should date with the hopes of marriage. Now, in, in a church, our, our church's size, you know, uh, you know, not everybody is a serious Christian. Some people are what we call baby Christians. And we try to create an atmosphere in our church where everybody feels welcome. Man, I'm still struggling with sin. I'm still struggling with areas. I'm still learning. That's okay. There's room. That's why we're not going around badgering everybody, right? It's not even often that I take time to educate like this. But right now I am because it's important because I know there's people wanting to connect and hook up. And I want to make sure that you do it right. Now, if I didn't care, I wouldn't even say nothing. If I didn't care, oh, who cares? And if their life falls apart, other people will come and take their place anyways. That's not the heart that God has given me for his people. The heart God has given me for his people is that, that you would make it and grow and be strong and learn right and have a good godly family one day. Come on, somebody. Let me hear the, help. the single people say amen. In Genesis Good for man to Lord said it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Someone say suitable. And these are things that sometimes, like, you know, we need help understanding. Like, hey, is this suitable? Is this relationship suitable? Is this timing suitable? 
and we take time to get advice. Romantic awakenings lead to thoughts accompanied by feelings that lead to actions. And it's God's plan for romantic love. However, if these, these awakenings happen during a season when they can't be righteously fulfilled, they often lead down a path of hurt and regret. So what do we do? We make sure that dating is not an emotional response. You shouldn't start a relationship because you saw the notebook last night. And now you're like, what? Oh. Next. And unfortunately, that's how some people's lives are. Next. 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 And let me tell you something, ladies. When you want to, when the, when the, when I want a bowl of cereal, I don't go to the sink and get a bowl that's already been used. I go to the cabinet and pull a clean bowl out of it. And that goes for the man of God too. You think you want to be bouncing around all over the place. You're talking to this person, talking to that person. And no, you want to be a blessing to the person that God is going to bring you to. So because of that, you say, man, I ain't no cheap throne. Let, my, let everybody have an eternal. I'm going to keep myself pure for God. I'm going to keep myself pure for my future husband, my future wife. Ah. You said, did he just say that? Yes, I did. <laughs> Dating shouldn't be an emotional response. It's just because you're going through it. Just because your friend's dating. Oh, and I feel lonely. We're not emotional-led people as serious Christians. Now, I know not everybody's a serious Christian. You say, well, I'm not ready to let people, you know, give me advice. And that's okay. You're still welcome to come to church. But there's a lot of us that say, no, I'm here because I, I want to be a serious Christian, you know. Serious Christians, they're not led by their emotions. So dating shouldn't be just an emotional response. It definitely shouldn't be a physical response. Oh, I want to date her. I want to date her. Have you seen her? I want to date her. I want to date her. Have you seen her? I want to date her. I want to date her. And you're just physically attracted. Physical attraction is not enough for a man or woman of God to say, I'm going to enter into a dating relationship with this person just because I'm physically attracted. It shouldn't be an emotional response. It shouldn't be a physical response. And it shouldn't be a let's see what happens response. But dating should be a prayed over response. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Galatians 5, 16 says, the apostle Paul tells us, walk by the spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit and the spirit what's contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So we need to make sure that we're doing spiritual things. Why? Why is it important to make sure you're, you're moving forward? spiritually led because if we do things in a fleshly way we will get fleshly results are you guys hearing me tonight we want to make sure that it's aligned up with my purpose result, uh, response I'm dating because it lines up with my purpose I'm dating because you know there's wisdom in the multitude of counsel response some people could care less what other people think and that's why I look at most of us are old enough to know, right? Most of us are old enough to know that we don't need anybody's permission, right? We're all adults, but, but the some of us here, we understand that it's not permission that we want. It's wisdom that we want. It's guidance that we want. It's the experience that we want. We value our calling and our testimony. So we want to ask our leaders how they feel about this situation. I try to be very careful about this because I never want people to say like, oh man, you got to ask permission if you want to date somebody in this church. It's not about that. It's about do you want to be somebody that values what your leaders think? If you're somebody that says, hey, I value, this is my community. How many say this is my community? So if you say this is my community, then you say, I value my testimony amongst my community. And because I value my testimony, what the brothers and the sisters think about me, and I want them to know that I'm, I'm serious about what God is doing in my life, I value and I what my leaders say. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 17, 
Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden. For what would be, that would be of no benefit to you. Amen? That would be, so we say, man, I'm going to value. There's wisdom in the multitude of counsel. You know, so here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to get involved with somebody and you guys are talking and all late on the phone. Let me tell you something. Nothing's going to stir up your emotions more than late night conversations. Being on the phone all late. I like pickles too. You like pickles? What about mustard? Not me neither. I don't like mustard. What are we going to name our kids? And then you're all, all distracted. You can't even live your life. You're all, uh, nothing. And then, and then you want to get all in love. And they'll be like, Pastor. And then Pastor's like, oh, man, there's a lot of red flags. I don't think this is suitable. Too late. Because you're already in love. It's like, get the water hose. Separate them. Right? And then you know what we have to do? We just have to say, well, man, are you guys going to? Am I making a plane? Am I making a plane? I'd rather talk straight to people and give you some stuff to think about and say, look it, man, or do you, you know, you want to have a lot of problems later or you want to, you know, do take care of it right now and do it right. Do it God's way. You know what happens? It may, doing it God's way may be harder. You may have to wait. You may have to trust in God. You may have to go through some painful nights. But I'll tell you something. God's way is better than our way. And when his blessing is upon it, come on with God for us. So I wanted just to take this opportunity just to say that. Do I have all the answers? No. You, you're a grown up and you're going to do what, what you feel is best for you to do? Sure. But my prayer is I hope that you value what your leaders think. And that you would have the wisdom enough and value what God's doing in your life enough to say, before I let my heart get all stirred up, before I start making decisions, let me back up and let me get some advice first. Right? Let me guess for let me ask my big brothers in the Lord. Let me ask my big sisters in the Lord. What do you think? And what do you think? And and not everybody that presents themselves, come on, somebody. Just because someone's been in the home for three months and they know how to comb their hair and brush their teeth now. You're like, ooh, that would be a great husband. Hold on now. I'm not going to put my stamp on that. They, how many know we still got a lot of things we got to work on? And that's what God wants to do. He says, hold on. Right now, this season is about you. I'm working on you. I'm building you. I'm preparing you so that later on, you guys could be a blessing and a power couple. And you could do great things for the honor and glory of God. Can I hear somebody say amen? amen. Now, if you're sneaking around, you're doing things in the back, we still love you. We're still going to pray for you. We just encourage you to want to do things better. And last thing I'm going to say, any, to any man or woman that there's someone trying to sneak into your, D, your, your DMs, huh, trying to pass you a note at church, would you need a tissue? There's a note wrapped up in there. Okay, before, <laughs> before, bef and then and they, they try to tell you this. Why? That's nobody's business but ours. And then all of a sudden they're against leaders and they're against, that should be a red flag to you. You know, if they come and they approach you, you should say, have you talked to the pastor, your, your leaders about this? No, why? I'm a grown man. I don't need to. Yeah, you, you grow a man yourself right out my path, beloved. Amen. There's wisdom in the multitude of counsel. Better to be safe and do it right than have regrets and hurts later. Amen. Give the Lord a good hand of praise for that. I hope you hear my heart behind it. We're not trying to run nobody's life. We're just trying to help. We're just trying to, you know, be there. And, and, and we're available. Any of the ministers is available. I'm available. You want advice? You want to talk more about it? Please let us know. And with that, I'm going to be presenting a couple that they're going, they're, they're going to be dating in our church. They're a couple now. They're dating. They're, you know, they like each other. And, um, you know, I, I thank God that they've, um, that they came to us. They gave us that, they, you know, from the very beginning before they even talked to each other. What do you think? And what do you think? And I said, no, I will talk and be friends and see how it goes and be careful. And they did that. And they're like, yeah, well, we think it went well. And, you know. It's <laughs> okay, well, then, you know, just, just be cool and, right, give us some time. And, okay, we did that. What, what's next, right? 
And we said, okay, when they said, we just want to make sure like everybody knows that we're not just over here trying to talk in the shadows, but God is in it and our leaders know about it. So we just want to bring it out in the open and so that everybody knows what's happening with them. Amen. They're also going to be singing a song tonight. Let's put our hands together for Sammy and Carla as they make their way. Amen. God, God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to say thanks. Thank you, God, for this beautiful opportunity. Uh, you know, I, I'm incredibly, you know, surprised and amazed that uh, God's plan unfolding in, in both of our lives. And I would just say this to the singles and to everyone else, you know, something that God dropped in my heart. He said that, that um, God will always look after your best interest as so long as your interest is in him. So I just thought I'd say that. Amen. Why you why you stand, amen? I just want to go ahead and thank the Lord for my salvation, amen. And I thank God for his keeping promise, amen. You may be seated, excuse me, you may be seated. But I thank God for his keeping promise over my life. You know, um, Monday, April 15, uh, was 10 years that I've been saved, set free by the blood of Christ, amen. You know, so I turned 10 years old in the spirit. Come on, somebody. April 15th was a a day that I cannot forget. You know, I came into the men's home, you know, just a young man. Come on. I came into the men's home, just a young man. I was 31 years old. It was two weeks after my birthday. You know, my birthday lands on Easter every 10 years. And it was the Easter, I remember, you know, and I was walking down the streets, you know, on my 31st birthday. And I was like, Lord, uh, before I even said, Lord, I said, I just need help. You know, and I remember reaching out, you know, to one of my good friends, Brother Miguel, you know, and I, and I told him I need help, and he told me about Jesus Christ, amen. And I went into the home, amen, and I ain't looked back since. Praise the Lord. Also, I want to thank our pastors. You know, I thank Pastor Ezra and Sister Ruth, amen. I, I'm truly grateful for you, Pastor. You know, since I've been here, part of this church, you and your wife has opened your arms to me and my wife and my family. You know, you've been a model. You've been a great example. You, I can call you my spiritual father, amen. I love you. You and Sister Ruth, thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity to share tonight. And also thank God for the leaders, you know, the men and men of God that, you know, have been paying the way and being a good example and, and, and you know, just being a, 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 a mentor to, to me and some of the guys that are here. Amen. And last but not least, I want to thank my beautiful wife. Amen. I thank God for my wife, Celeste. We've been married for four years, you know, and we got... Three beautiful kids, three beautiful boys, amen, and God's such a, a blessing in my life, you know, and was able to bless me with three boys and a beautiful wife, amen. Praise the Lord. But 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 16, I want to do a, bit, a little bit of reading. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 16 says, and this is Elijah speaking, and he said, thus says the Lord, make this valley, someone say Valley. Come on, say valley. Make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain. Yet the valley should be filled with water so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. Verse 18. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hands. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you tonight. And, Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that is moving here in this place. Father, I pray that you'll move me to the side and let your anointing fill my life up. Lord, I pray that you'll speak to me, God, and through me, God, Lord, to your people. Lord, I pray that every heart would be open to receive this word here tonight. In Jesus' name, we all say. Before we get into our key scripture on what the Lord said through the prophet Elijah, here is a little backstory in the beginning of chapter 3. Now, there were three kings that were about to go up against the king Mesha, the king of Moab, and the Moabites. The first king was the king of Israel, whose name was Jerum, the son of Ahab, who wasn't as evil as his father, but still sinned in the eyes of God. Now, the second king was the king of Judah, whose name was Jehoshaphat. Now, when Jehoshaphat was a man that believed in God, but his heart was far from God. 
And the third king was the king of Edom, which the Bible doesn't state the king's name, but we do know that the name Edom was from the name of Esau, the same Esau who sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. So it came to pass that all three kings had approached the valley that was dry, and there didn't have any water to drink for themselves or for their cattle. So King Jerome, the king of Israel, said, At last, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hands of, the Mo to the, the hands of Moab. You see, I'm pretty sure I'm talking to Victor Irish people here tonight. How many been on a mission before? How many been on a mission before? How many didn't bust some movidas? Come on, somebody. You didn't bust some moves, you know, in your, your BC days, you know? And then I guarantee you, you probably went on a mission and you were like, what am I doing here on this mission? What am I getting myself into? You know, and, and out the crew, you always have that one guy who's a hothead, who's always talking crazy, talking reckless, always coming up with a bright idea, but it's not going nowhere. You always got that one person that think he knows it all. This is the king of Israel. I, I always butcher his name, but it's Jer Jerome. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to call him Jerome, right? <laughs> Jerome, right? Always think he got a great idea, you know? He's real shady, always in the flesh. Come on, somebody. But Jehoshaphat, and then also the other person, you got the other person, the king of Edom, who don't have a name. Come on, somebody. He don't have a name. He's just that person that's like, what am I doing here? He's probably the person that you would probably use, use their car. You know, you're probably using them for whatever they got. They might know a guy that know a guy, and you're just using him, and he's just there, you know? A person that don't have no name, but he's there. But then you have Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat said, is there no prophet of the land here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elijah, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. Then Elijah said to the king of Israel, what have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, no, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hands of the Moabs. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely where it's not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I will not look at you nor see you. Woo. Come on, that's the man of God said, I don't even want to look at you. You lust monster, you're a flesh monster. You're always in the sin. You're always in the carnitas. Come on, somebody. That's the man of God that looked at the king and was like, you, you always up to no good. You always been shady, you know. But he said because of Jehoshaphat, he said because of Jehoshaphat, the Bible says, but now bring me a musician. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. Verse 16, and he said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. Now the definition of the word ditch is a narrow channel dug in the ground. In other words, a hole, or we can dig a or we can say a dig a ditch to make a well. Or however you want to describe it, God told them to, build, to make a valley full of ditches. Now in the beginning of the year, we heard our pastor share with us about the Lord wanting to do what wanting to do with his church. And he shared that he was praying and he was asking God for a powerful word in 2024. And the Lord gave him a simple word. And that word was dig. Someone say dig. dig. Someone say dig. dig. Keep digging, the Lord told him. Keep digging. So the title of my message tonight is Digging for Your Future. So when God told Elijah, the man of God, to tell them to make a valley full of ditches, I'm pretty much, I'm pretty sure he told them to dig. And just like God told our pastor, the man of God, I believe the Lord is telling us to dig. Who can say amen? 
You see, we already have a well that's been dug for us, and that was the mother church that was here in La Puente. And even though the mother church is in Chino, God is still telling us to dig. I said God is still telling us to dig. I don't believe in coincidence. I don't believe that there was, this was, I believe that this was a divine purpose by God for us to have a church in the San Gabriel Valley right here in the city of West Covina. I believe God said to keep digging ditches right here in the valley because God is going to raise up a church right there in Ambassador, La Puente, come on, Azusa, El Mani, Covina. I believe God is going to raise up a church. God is going to tell some men and women to keep digging because I want you to go plant a church all over the SGV region. Who could say amen? amen? God is telling us to keep digging. Keep digging for your future. Which brings me to my first point. Keep digging for your purpose. Someone say purpose. Keep digging for your purpose. Proverbs chapter 19 verse 21 says, Many are the plans in the person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. If you look at the three kings, their plan was to go and destroy the Moabites and take their land because the king of Moab didn't want to pay tribute to the king of Israel. But to their surprise, when they came into the valley, it was dry. And because that wasn't the purpose that God had in store for them. So when Elijah told them to dig a ditch and keep digging, I'm pretty sure they were digging. They were probably mumbling and complaining like, why am I digging these ditches? Why am I over here in the man's home waking up at 6 o'clock in the morning praying and reading my word? God was telling them to keep digging. I'm pretty sure as they was digging those ditches, they were probably saying, why am I over here uh, uh, and part of the gang and I got to come on a Friday night and I'm a young person? Don't you know I want to be in a club? Don't you know I want to be partying? Don't you know I want to do all these things? No, God was telling them to keep digging. And I believe God is telling us to keep digging here tonight. These ditches are going to be filled up with water. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. The Lord is telling us to keep digging because he has a plan for you. Who could say amen? amen. Now, like how, now I like how it translated in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 16, according to the new NIV, where it says, I will fill this valley with pools of water. Like when our pastor shared in a message that he preached, dig deep. That's why it's important to always go back on YouTube and look at the messages, amen? That's why it's very important to go back and just, you know, go ahead and look at the message. Come on, some men of God that have been out here preaching, sharing the word of God. It's always good to go back and replay the message. So when pastor uh, uh, message, when I, I, I played pastor's message and I, and I was looking at some things that he shared, he said, where is there is water, there is life. And where there is water, there is growth. Come on, I'm going to say that again. Where there is water, there is life. And where there is water, there is growth. When water starts to flow, life starts to change. Our pastor shared that. Where there is water, things begin to change. Water, water represents life. When we come into the church and you see on a, on a Sunday, come on, first service packed out, second service packed out, third service packed out. You know that there's water right here in the house. You know that it was some men and women that were digging. If you look right here on this board, you see some men and women that were digging. They were getting a hold of God. They believed because it was some water right here in the wells of the San Gabriel Valley. They kept digging. They said, you know what? I'm willing to pledge. I'm willing to put my finances. I'm willing to sow seed. I'm willing to come help out in the children's ministry, in the third wave. I'm willing to help out in the campus. I'm willing to help out with the ushers, right? That was some men and women that said, I'm going to keep digging because there's water in the wells right here at the West Covina. Who can say amen? amen? Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise, amen? There's water right here in the house. And I believe we have water right here in Victory Outreach, West Covina. Which brings me to my second point. Keep digging for the plan that God has in store for your life. Now in verse 17, the plan was this. You should not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. 
I'm going to say that again. You should, not, you should not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water so that you, your cattle, and the animals may drink. Now, because of this, their obedience, and the Lord told, the king, told them to keep digging, God's plan was to provide water for them, and not only for them, but for their cattle. I believe that their cattle, for us, could represent our wealth. I believe that their cattle for us could represent our wealth. See, when you are sowing seed here in the house of God, I believe the Lord is going to provide water for your finances. I believe God is going to provide water for, for your businesses, for your homes, for your children, for those that are far off. I believe God is going to provide water. Why? Because he's telling you to keep digging. All you got to do is be obedient, listen to the voice of God, continue to pray, continue to fast, continue to reach, continue to minister, continue to go out and disciple and and evangelize and witness the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is telling us to keep digging. Who can say amen? amen. Come on, I don't know if you hear me tonight. God is telling us to keep digging. God is placing anointing upon our church. God is placing anointing upon our pastor, upon our leaders. God is placing anointing upon Victory Outreach International. All he is telling us is to be obedient to the vision. All you have to do is keep digging for the wells that we have right here in the, gate, in the San Gabriel Valley. Who can say amen? Someone say keep digging. I believe he's going to provide new businesses, new opportunities, and purchase a new home or thrive in your job, or even if you already own your business, I believe God is going to give us a church. Come on, somebody. Why? Because God has already given us this church. We already outgrown this church. Come on. Within four years, we already outgrown it. And I believe God has already have a building with our name on it. I believe God already has a building with our name on it that's going to seat over a thousand, thousand chairs. I believe that by faith. And I'm speaking into existence because the Bible says speak it into existence. You know, so I want to encourage you here tonight. Keep digging. Dig for your future. Dig for your family members. Dig for those that are far off. We have water right here in, in West Covina. We have people that we need to go out and reach. We have children that need to be raised up here in the house of God. So when family members come in here and, and they see that this is a healthy church and they see that it is men and women that have been praying, come on, we're going to be here on a Friday night. Come on, we're going to be out here from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. praying, fasting, believing that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. All you got to do is keep digging. I believe God is going to provide because of our obedience to his word. You see, God's plan is not always going to be what we want it to be or what we expect. Now, here we have four fishermen that were making an honest living by catching fish and selling it to feed and support their family. And then here comes Jesus. Come on, somebody. And there here comes Jesus. And Mark chapter 1, verse 16 Walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then Jesus told them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Then immediately they left their nets and followed him. The same James and John. Same with James and John. They followed Jesus. Now, I can only imagine that their flesh was probably saying, to them, who is this man telling me to leave our professions, to throw away our nets, to throw away our equipment, to forget about feeding our family, to forget about supporting our children? Who is this man telling us to follow him? Well, that man name is Jesus, and he wants you to follow him. It might not make sense, but it's the plan of God that he has in store for your life. Psalms chapter 31 verse 11 says, but put the plans of the Lord, but put, but the plans of the Lord stands firm forever. The purpose of his heart through all generations. Isaiah chapter 46 verse 10 through 11. I will make known the ends from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. 
I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I am pleased. From the east, I summons a bird of prey from far off lands, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said that I will bring about, what I have planned that I will do. Who could say amen? God has a plan and a promise for you. And the plan involves a man or a woman that is called by him to fulfill his purpose by loving him and others and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the kingdom of heaven. Which brings me to my third and final point as we all stand. Hallelujah. Now my first point was to keep digging for your purpose. And my second point was to keep digging for the plan that God has in store for you. And my third and final point is keep digging for your promise. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 18. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hands. God said that he would bring deliverance to his people. Even though King Jerome, Jerome, come on, even though King Jerome was wicked in the sight of God, the Lord still told, said, to, said that I would deliver the Moabites into your hands. Even though King Jehoshaphat was far from God, he still said that I would deliver the Moabites into your hands. Even though the nameless king of Edom, who was considered an enemy of God and was tagging along with the kings of Israel, of Judah, the Lord said, I will deliver the Moabites into your hands. I want to tell you tonight, even though you are still dealing with that sin that only you and God knows, God is telling you to keep digging and he will deliver you from the Moabites. God is telling you to keep digging and he will heal your lands. God is telling you to keep digging and he's going to reach your family member that you've been praying for. God is telling you to keep digging and he's going to provide all your needs. God is telling you to keep digging. If you're praying for that co-worker or you're praying for the yoke of bondage to be broken over your life, God is telling you to keep digging. If you're believing that generation curses are going to be broken, God is telling you to keep digging. If you're believing in signs and miracles, God is telling you to keep digging. If you believe that we're going to have a church that is going to see a thousand people, God is telling you to keep digging. Don't give up because your breakthrough is on the other side of the corner. I want to let you know if you're obedient to God, God will give you everything that you're asking for. All you have to do is keep digging. Who can say amen? The Lord still said he's going to deliver you from whatever the Moabites that represent your sin into your hands. Meaning that he's going to give you victory over the Moabites only if you keep digging. Now pastor spoke a powerful message on Sunday about having your eyes wide open. He said, when our eyes are wide open, we see truth. He said, when our eyes are wide open, we see that more is with us than with them. He said, when our eyes are wide open, we see what God is trying to show us. And he said, when our eyes are wide open, we see Jesus. Who can say amen? When you keep digging, you will see salvation come to your families and your loved ones. When you keep digging, you will see the bondages and generation curses broken. When you keep digging, you will see all these promises that God has in store for you be fulfilled. Praise the Lord. I want to go ahead and open up the altars right now. But before you come, amen, before you come, I just want to share this. You know, God might be dealing with some of us, you know, that we, we think like, man, like, how can I? God, who am I? Like, I, I, I missed the mark. I missed the mark. I, I, I sin, I fall short of your glory. And you're like, God, who am I? But it's countless of men in the Bible that has dropped the ball, that has missed the mark, that has filled the short of glory of God. I want to let you know that God is able to set you free from whatever sin is in your life. Well, thanks for joining us here at Victory Outreach West Covina. We hope you enjoyed your time. Also, I want to encourage you to subscribe 
and click the notification bell. That way you get notified every time we go live, you won't miss a service. Stay connected with us and you can also partner with us in your giving if you wanna bless the ministry financially so we can continue the work that God is doing here. You can do that at any time. I hope you share it and I hope you come visit us live real soon. God bless you.